we welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. What a great mercy it is that he has gathered us once again to praise his name, to delight in him, and to delight in his people. I trust that throughout the week you have faithfully prayed for the day of worship, that your hearts have been engaged day in and day out, that God would meet with us, that He would speak powerfully by His Word, and that we might come with prepared hearts, ready and eager to joyfully lift up our hearts and magnify Him. If you walk in stone cold, My question for you is why? Why would you come into God's presence like a rock? Soften up your heart through the week. Get in the presence of Almighty God. Cry out to Him that He will meet with us. Don't come and expect the people on the pew next to you to fire you up or the pastor to be the opening act to get you ready. Come with hearts overflowing, with love and adoration for the Almighty. And then we will enter into worship as many of us have never tasted. May God in His mercy pour out His Spirit. Thank you for praying for Myra and me uh, on our trip to Kerrville, Texas. It was a wonderful time. I even had some say, we pray that this will be a wonderful time for you and Myra. Well, it was, because uh, the Lord really met with us at the conference. We were very uh, encouraged by the messages preached. Uh, The people there were obviously there to hear the word of God, and they were hungry, and there were many good discussions about the messages. So thank you for your prayers. Uh, We were thankful for the safe journey, for the the fellowship, and for the power that God granted uh, in the preaching of His Word. And we want want that here. We want God's power in our midst. We don't want religious talk, and we don't want to fool ourselves like the Pharisees. We want to be God's people people who know him and walk with him by the power of the new birth and then gather with hearts of fire to magnify him. <clears throat> you never know when your last worship service will be. You don't want to walk in cold or leave cold. May God by his spirit gloriously move in awakening and converting and sanctifying power. That said, we want to open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 23. If you have a cell phone, please check it and make sure that it's on mute. We had a number of unexpected concerts at the conference as... uh, (laughs) As they were going off here and there. We don't want to do that. Let's make sure our phones are on mute. <clears throat> we want to be surprised by the Lord, not the device in our pocket. So, <clears throat> I love to be here. I'm thankful for every pra- place where I meet with God's people. But I love to be here. Matthew chapter 23. We're going to read this morning verses 23 and 24. 23 and 24. Let's stand together and give our attention to the word of God. It's our... Brother prayed earlier, brethren, if if we really understood, first of all, what we have that we hold in our hands, and then if we understood 
the very blood that has sealed our having this word in our own language, we would realize that we have no other earthly gift like this. This is the word of God. Let us hear it. Let us walk in it. Matthew 23, verse 23. The inspired, infallible, and preserved word of God. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe and mint, or ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Amen. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His word. Let's unite our hearts at the throne of grace. Almighty God, quiet us, for we come into thy holy presence. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. We have lost, O God, in our generation, Thy majesty, Thy splendor, Thy glorious, awesome holiness. O Father, forgive us when we have little thoughts of Thee. Forgive us when we're impressed by vessels of sinful dust and not awestruck with Almighty God. Forgive us, Lord, that we do not seek Thy face more earnestly. Lord, I pray that every one of Thy regenerate souls here this morning awoke delighted that it was the Lord's day and was ready in heart and soul hotly to pursue the worship of Almighty God, to sing with hearts overflowing with grace, to come to pray with those who lead in prayer, to lift our voices in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as those that have been saved from the fires of hell, saved from bondage to Satan, saved from the chains of our lusts and all of our sins. People set free. Oh God, would we worship like people set free. Spirit of God, fall upon us, rend the heavens and come down. Fill us with joy. Fill us with godly sorrow and help us to repent over sins. Give us ears to hear. Give us eyes to see. Illuminate us this morning. Don't leave us to our backwards flesh, O God. Don't leave us to our own little ideas. Breathe thy holy revelation upon us. Enlighten our minds transform us and help us to bring glory to Thee in what we think and what we say and what we do in this world. Oh, may we exalt Jesus Christ this morning. Oh, Jesus, how I praise and thank Thee that Thy love for us never runs cold. 
even though ours for thee sometimes does. Oh, may we stand in the fire of thy holy purity. May thy spirit shed abroad thy love in our hearts. May we be captured by high and lofty thoughts of thee. May we be gripped with truths, Lord, perhaps that we've heard a thousand times, and yet, O oh God, may we hear them with fresh uh, and revitalized awakenings. May we meditate on what we hear today. May we not lose this afternoon what thou and thy grace giveth us this morning. O oh, bless thy people. Fill them, fill them with thy spirit this morning. May we all know that our God is with us. We pray for our sick. We pray, O oh God, for our sister Nellie. Lord God, healer of this Pneumonia, and grant her grace. May the medication be helpful. Lord, we know thou canst speak and she can roll out of the bed right now to the amazement of all those in the hospital. We ask thee to do what brings thee the most glory. Lord, thou mayest, whatever thou hast purposed, we pray, that she would be abundantly aware that underneath are the everlasting arms. Now, O oh Christ, I pray that we have not lied when we sang, Thou, O oh Christ, art all I want. Satisfy our longings in Thee. Help us to hear Thy word and be transformed today Lord, as the conference in Texas continues, may the word of God continue to go forth with power there as we plead that thou wilt do here. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Jesus stood in the temple precincts at Jerusalem and publicly humiliated the scribes and Pharisees as he pronounced eight scathing woes upon them. God in human flesh plainly revealed his displeasure with the religious leaders of God's people. That is a sobering thought. Jesus' devastating denunciations exposed the corruption and hypocrisy of their unbelieving hearts. So now we take up the fifth woe in this extraordinary list of curses pronounced on the Jewish leaders. May I remind all of us, may we not come and sit back in our nice, comfortable air-conditioned building in our padded pews and say, oh, how wicked those Pharisees were. How could they have had the Word of God and been rebuked by God? How could they have had the Word of God and not known how to live in it? How could they have had the Word of God and not even recognized God in their presence? We're made of the same stuff. We're looking in a mirror. And we need to understand that while we may not be unregenerate as they were, in our wicked flesh, we may fall into the same wicked corruptions. 
May it not be. We've been warned. Listen, I've been warned. You've been warned by God. Don't be hearers of the word only. But doers of the word. Let us learn from the errors of the scribes and Pharisees. Let us see where we are fallible and perhaps even unwittingly following in the same wicked mindset masquerading as religious as they. So the title of our message is Reversing God's Priorities. Reversing God's Priorities. May our loving Heavenly Father, His love is better than any other love. May the love of our Heavenly Father be shed abroad in our hearts. May the Spirit of God enlighten us. May God, in His great goodness, make the presence of His Holy Son sweet to us, precious to us, even when His words may be scalding to us. May we love Him as a Father that may chasten us. And may we love Him for the enormous gifts He's given us today. The most glorious of all, His precious Son. Let's love Him with all our hearts. So let us take up the fifth woe. Jesus denounced the scribes and Pharisees for reversing God's priorities. Let's remember, He says regularly, Hypocrites! And then he tells us why. In the first three woes, found in verses 13 through 15, Jesus exposed and humiliated the Jews' leaders with this formula. Woe unto you! Scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. How terrible, how tragic are God's withering judgments that will fall on you, you religious pretenders. That's how we began seven of these eight Woes. Addressing them this way, Jesus was focusing on the sin of their hypocrisy. But in verses 16 through 22, the fourth woe, Jesus changed his address to, Woe unto you, blind guides! By that, Jesus was focusing on their distortion of God's infallible Word. The scribes and Pharisees sat on Moses' seat, as Jesus said, as interpreters and teachers of God's law. But they manipulated God's scriptures regarding binding and non-binding vows which deeply misguided their hearers. They were blind. They were blind as every lost person is. Blind to spiritual things. You can put Spurgeon, you can put Lloyd-Jones, you can put Pastor Martin, you can take the Lord Jesus Himself, as this text proves, and He can tell you the truth with the power of Almighty God, and you can nod your head and say, Amen, and go to hell. 
And you and I will think that's somebody else in the room. Not me. But that's exactly why passages like this are here. So that we'll sit down and say, is that me? Lord, show me. That's all I want to know. Show me. If I don't know you, I want to know you with all my heart. Listen, all of us in here have been poisoned by, by American religion. You've grown up with this idea that somebody just comes into a building, uh, they hear a message, they walk the aisle, they shake the preacher's hand, they're okay with God, they're, they're told never to doubt it, and then they walk, and, and, and a lot of times they'll, they'll say things like, well, you know, Christianity really doesn't work. That's a misunderstanding. American religion, decisionism, easy believism, and the kind of things that have been preached not only in this nation but around the world, sometimes for centuries, don't work. They give people a false sense of being right with God. We're waiting for a thunderbolt to knock us over. And children, those of you brought up in Christian homes, this is vital for you to understand. Some of you may be sitting and waiting for some earth-shattering experience to happen. Or for this moment where you, like Paul, on the, on the way to Damascus, have a, a heavenly vision. It doesn't come that way. You must repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know that you are a sinner, if you know that you're not doing things that mom and daddy tell you, or at least you're doing them in front of them, but not behind their backs. You know you're a sinner. Jesus is talking to men that grew up in religious homes. That's all they ever knew. They weren't bikers, they weren't rock musicians, they weren't drug dealers. Uh, they, I mean, they had lives that everybody admired. Do we understand why things like this are in the Bible? It's not for us to sit back and go, wow, they're really bad. Boy, were they blockheads. Wow, were they, those foul hypocrites. It's in here because this is the nature of fallen humanity, even at its highest religious fire. You can't walk with God without His truth. And when preachers distort that truth, it's guaranteed that no matter how comfortable everyone might be with their religion, they can't please God. They can't honor God. They cannot magnify His grace. Even sometimes while saying, grace, yeah, grace. I believe the doctrines of grace. And their lives lie about them every day. Now, these things are here as a good mirror and wake-up call for all of us. Live with this chapter. Read it. Read it again. Ask yourself, is this me or are you always thinking about someone else when you're reading it? Examine your own heart. When I hear those words, blind guides, I'm not sure that I tremble enough. Every pastor, every elder, every teacher of God's word, every person that thinks maybe God called him to teach needs to look at those words and say, Lord, am I guiding people in your truth or am I one of the blind leading the blind to fall into the ditch of your judgment brethren 
Easy believism in American religion comes with a lot of self-righteousness. And we don't want to fool ourselves. So, by calling them blind guides, Jesus was focusing on their distortion of God's infallible word. <clears throat> now, in this fifth woe, Jesus returns to his original formula. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. But he adds blind guides. Because their hypocrisy distorted and reversed God's order. God's priorities as revealed in Scripture. Don't run. Don't run to say, oh yes. Those Pharisees overturned. They inverted God's word. It's true. But every one of us is guilty of this at some point where we have put something else, maybe even something good, over God's order and what He calls us to. Phariseeism is simply the flesh cranked up to its highest religious form. So Jesus pointed out first, the scribes and Pharisees paid great attention to tithing seasonings, spices. The Lord said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Jesus meant, that the religious leaders were scrupulous about tithing. Now children, the word scrupulous, I don't imagine many of you use it on a daily basis, but it's a good word to know. Scrupulous means careful, thorough, extreme, attentive to details. To be careful, to be thorough, and to be extremely attentive to details. Now, in their minds, the scribes and Pharisees gave this extreme attention to small matters because they were very concerned to avoid doing wrong. In itself, that is not a bad thing. And if your notion of grace is as long as I'm not killing anybody, as long as I'm not ripping off my business, as long as I'm not whoring around, I'm okay. You could learn something good from the Pharisees here. They understood that sin had brought the world into the, cu the curse that it's in. And that is why life is painful. Sometimes life is unbearable. That is why people do wicked things that scar people for years and years and years. They understood that sin did that and sin comes from our hearts. It's how you live without Christ. Everything you think, everything you say, everything you do is sin that will damn you. Everything. Now if that's the case, then you want to know what dishonors God and what brings Him glory. And it would do you good to sit down and think and examine the things you think and the things you say and the things you do. A lot of times grace for many of us is just a license to be sloppy in our so-called Christian lives. Not to take anything too seriously, because people who take things too seriously, especially little things, they're legalists. No, that's not true.
Jesus is not rebuking them for being scrupulous. You need to be very clear about this. He's not, he's not rebuking them and pronouncing woes upon their head because they're concerned about little sins. That's not why he brings this curse upon their heads. The tithe was something important. Tithing was an important part of Jewish worship. The law of Moses required a tithe. And that is a tenth of all that a person produced. Crops, fruit of trees, livestock. This in turn was used to sustain the Levites and the priests who did the work of the Lord and had no inheritance among the people. So it's God's way of sustaining those who were doing the work of <clears throat> first the tabernacle and then later the temple. It was built into God's worship to care for those who were doing the Lord's business. Leviticus 27.30 declares, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. We don't get this in America. We're hard-working people who are living out the American dream. And we've come from nowhere into something. And we've pulled ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And all this stuff and all the, all the things piling up, piling up in my house and in my garage and in my closets and all the stuff that I can't possibly use all the days of my life, it's all because I did it and it's mine. No, it's all the Lord's. It's all, you're breathing His air. You're eating His food. If you have clothes on your back, it's His mercy to you. If there's a penny in your pocket, if there's a quarter in your pocket, it's all God's. And you should be giving a portion of it to His work. Deuteronomy 14.23 says, Thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the, in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thine oil and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks. That thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. Fear of God here means his worship. Your reverent worship of God. Give to the Lord. Giving to the Lord is a serious part of worship. I hear people say, we're not under the old covenant anymore. We're in the greater and the better covenant. So nobody has to tithe. Well, let me put it to, this, put it to you this way. If it's the better covenant, then you ought to be giving more than a tithe. We got that? You give the government more than you give to God, probably. Nobody has to do what Myra and I did, but when we discovered how much we were having to give to the, to the government, I said, we're, we're not giving more to the government than we're going to give to God. We're going to give more to the Lord. Brethren, there's not a penny in your bank account that isn't God's. And it ought to be given to God's work, ultimately. Taking care of your family, that's part of his work. Putting clothes on your body, that's part of, part of his work. These are all things, I'm not saying uh, we, we just have to give it to churches and ministries. No, no, that's, <laughs> that's what the shysters and the hucksters want you to believe. But your giving needs to be governed by this book. Not what you think, not just what you hear on you know, clever radio guys. Here, use your money for this. No, make sure that whatever you're doing is in principle according to the word of God. This is the way God has had his people live from the beginning. He gives to his people and they give to his work.
You see, the place where God first put his name was Shiloh, <clears throat> where the tabernacle was located. And so that's where they would gather for the feast that he commanded. Later, the place was Jerusalem. And that's where the pilgrims would go for the feasts and the celebrations. So God's people were to tithe their grain, their wine, their oil, and their herds, and their flocks. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 11 and 12 says, Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause His name to dwell there. Listen carefully. Listen to the outworking of God's word in the lives of his people. Here is worship. It says, Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heave offering of your hand and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. That's one of the reasons the Lord so sternly rebuked the Pharisees in our last message, in woe number four, because they were confusing people about vows. Vows were part of their worship. When you distort the word of God, when preachers, pastors, when they don't know the word of God as they ought, they can say things that they mean with all their hearts. They may even be dripping sweat when they say them, but they can mislead God's people. That's a serious matter. God hates it when His Word, which should give us light and joy because it corrects the way we live so that we can live according to what God wants, is distorted. That's very sober. But he goes on to say, And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants, and the Levite that is within your gates. That's the point. Bring the tithes. Let's come together to worship. You bring your tithes. Then you even get a blessing from it. And what you bring, you bless the Levites and you bless the others with it. It's not about mine, 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 give me. It's about, it's the Lord's. God gave it to me and I'm bringing it to be a blessing to others. That's the idea. The Levite that is within your gate. He had no property. They had cities of refuge. They had some suburbs outside some of the tribes. But they were not given a state as the as the tribes were. They, their whole life was to be serving the Lord. Well, it says, for as much as he hath no part or inheritance with you. So you care for him. You take care of that minister to you. So bringing one's tithes to the Lord was not only a vital part of Hebrew worship, but it was the means of sustaining God's work. It was the means of sustaining God's work among the people of God. Now in our text, Jesus acknowledged that the scribes and Pharisees were extremely attentive to tithe mint, anise, and cumin. Mint was a plant with a pleasant, sweet-smelling oil which was used to season food and occasionally to put in medicine. Even then, they knew medicines didn't taste good. Anise, sometimes translated dill, was a plant with aromatic seeds. Children, aromatic means something that has a, a distinct odor. If you've ever maybe even crushed some celery seed or some of that, and there's, an, there's, a, there's a smell like nothing else you can think of. That's the idea of something aromatic. <clears throat> that was used in cooking as well. 
used to season food, and cumin was cultivated for its spicy seeds and was sometimes used in bread as well as other foods. So what are we talking about? Little bitty seeds. These little bitty seeds were a very big deal for the Pharisees and for the scribes. They made sure You picture somebody sitting at their table, counting out seeds, looking at their, what they've brought in, what kind of harvest they have, and making sure that they've given God his part. Now, you know, if that were, if that were a, a, uh, a condition of joining this congregation, I would be preaching to an empty room this morning. They were serious. God said a tenth. We're going to make sure he gets his part. So, with that in mind, the Pharisees were careful. They were thorough. And they were extremely attentive to give a tenth of garden seasonings and spices to the Lord. Jesus does not rebuke them for this. You need to make sure you read this carefully. This powerful woe that he levels on them is not because they're scrupulous. That's become a word that in many Christian congregations has just has become essentially synonymous with legalist or someone you don't want to be around a lot because, man, they're always concerned about every detail of what it means to be a Christian. We're saved by grace, man. We can just slop this thing around. I didn't know why he rebuked them. Jesus went on to say that the scribes and Pharisees paid no attention to the weightier matters of God's law. That's the issue. Not the scrupulosity, but the fact that they omitted the weighty things of God's law. According to Jesus, they omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith. Number one, judgment in this context means justice. The word judgment, especially in the authorized version, is used in several places where you must learn how the context tells you how it's being used because it's a word like world that has quite a number of meanings. In this context, it's the idea of justice. In fact, that is why they use the word judgment. It's the, it, it is an evaluation of what is right and wrong and then choosing what is right. That's judgment. That's what you and I should be doing every day. We've been told so much, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge, that Christ was talking about a, a sinful kind of judgment. But you and I make judgments every single day. And they need to be according to the word of God. At least the very principles of God's word. That's part of loving God with all of your heart and soul and mind. You you evaluate things. You you go, ah, well, that's really bad. Well, why do you think abortion is bad? It's not mentioned in the Bible. Why do you think it's bad? Because there are principles that when we read this book carefully and take what it says seriously, we come to the clear understanding. We can look at the fact that a a woman is carrying a human life in her womb and she purposefully chooses to destroy that life, that that is murder. That's judging. And you do it every day. This is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. I'll do this, I won't do that. The thing is, is it justice? Is it in harmony with God's word? You might be calling good evil, and you might be calling evil good. I've seen people in certain churches that they would say, If you even smell the alcohol 
on a cap that's popped off a beer top. You're sinning against God. And then they'll go home and put 150 pounds on their body by the stuff they eat and never blink at their own hypocrisy. This is what I'm talking about. Is your scale of what's right and wrong according to God's word? Is it right because it's in harmony with the righteous God? Or is it wrong because it's out of harmony? The Pharisees were missing justice. They could count out the seeds to make their tithe and feel good about themselves. But they were missing something vital. Justice. Certain husbands have this book. And they know it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. They don't give any time to learning what that means or how to do it. But I can assure you, they've got some standards of right and wrong. And some of them that they might get really fired up and on their haunches about. But even if it's really wrong, it doesn't compare to that command. Look in the mirror. Certain men say, yeah, yeah, we're in the family movement. And then they constantly deride their wives in front of the children. Or vice versa. Yeah, well, we believe the Bible. And then their family is an utter wreck. Because the fathers simply don't obey what God says. This is the heart and soul of Phariseeism. You're it. And so am I. And we must be aware of it. We must be exposed. And regenerate people must repent. God is just. He demands, therefore, that we treat each other with justice. That's what, what God commands us to do. <clears throat> the psalmist said, He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Justice there is the notion. The Lord is known by the judgment, the justice, which He executeth. It's His character. He is righteous. Therefore, in His actions toward men and women and children, He is righteous. He is just. We're made in His image. And when we're born again, we're recreated in His image. There should be a drive in us for justice. And there should also be a burning desire for that to begin first in our own minds and hearts about what it means to be just. And then start being just toward others. And we can say, Ah, oh, wait a minute, I'm paying for this food and it didn't come out, this steak did not come the way I ordered it. And we chew out everybody in the place. Well, it's perfectly fine to say, you know, this isn't how I ordered it. Could, you, could we, uh, can we get that straight? But no, we become outraged. Outraged. This is not just. But I imagine if we followed each other around our homes, we might find some things where we're not so just. And we get upset if somebody else gets angry about it. This is the spirit of Phariseeism. Jesus is nailing them to the wall before they nail him to the cross about their injustice. You can tie that seed all you want, but you're forgetting to treat other people the way God has commanded you. God's people should be just in all their dealings with all people. With lost people. 
You should be just with your enemies. That's a part of loving your enemies. Jesus was in the role of God's prophet once again. That's, that is what's happening here. Don't forget, Jesus is the prophet, the priest, and the king. And right now, he is in the prophet mode. He's speaking to the leaders of Israel as the prophets of old spoke to Jerusalem and to Israel. He is, if I may say it this way, in that long line of the great prophets. He is, of course, the greatest. I mean, Isaiah had declared to Judah and Jerusalem, Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well, seek judgment. It's justice. He's giving you an example of what it means to be unjust. And he's saying, correct that. Let's put a footnote to that. There are a lot of Christians that somehow or another think that grace exempts them from correcting themselves. Right? Here's how it usually goes. God's got to do it. I can't do it. Well, one and two are true. But they're not the whole picture. God gives you grace so that you can serve Him. He regenerates you. He gives you power from the world to come through the Holy Ghost to be what He's called you to be. Don't use grace to disobey God. Use grace to learn how to walk with God. Yes, yes, I know. Nobody does it perfectly. But we can do it. And we can get better at doing it. Not because it's us. It is God's grace. But by faith, trusting Christ, we obey Him. By faith, in Christ, through His grace alone, we obey Him. And that is your responsibility. He's given you the grace to do it. By the way, let me make a correction to something I said two weeks ago. I mentioned that when I was in Williston preaching, <clears throat> someone came up to me and, and said, uh, I, I've sat under a lot of you know, really uh, wonderful and well-known grace preachers, but they never told me how to live or what my responsibilities were. I just hear grace and election and perseverance. And very often they don't even really understand perseverance. If they un understood perseverance, they'd understand half the things we argue about. Persevering means going on by faith in Christ. Because God by his grace preserves you. And in that grace by which he preserves you, you will persevere. You will obey him. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his creation in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So grace should never be your example, or your excuse, for not walking in what God says. Should be the very fuel in your heart for obeying the living God. Well, it was brought up to me later that uh, I may have implied the pastor at Williston in what the other person complained to me about. And I, I want to exonerate him completely. If any of you had that idea, I was not talking about the pastor in Williston. Uh, he's a faithful man. He preaches the truth. And I'm very thankful not only that he preaches the truth, but that he is a brother and a friend. So if you thought I was talking about the pastor at Williston when I talked about those things, or when that gentleman said what he said to me, that's not what we were talking about. He was a man that had moved there from another state and was talking about other pastors, so-called grace pastors that he'd heard. So 
I was not talking about our brother in Williston. That being the case, back to the Pharisees. God wants judgment, justice in our lives. And you do it. You do it by the power of the Holy Spirit, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the instruction of God's word. That's why he made you alive. I hope that makes sense. Don't coast on grace. Walk in grace. So, Jeremiah said the same kind of thing. Execute ye judgment. He said to the people, be just and righteous. Deliver the spoil out of the, land of the, out of the hand of the oppressor. And do no wrong, do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless, nor the widow. Neither shed innocent blood in this place. He's telling them to do something and not to do something. I grew up hearing people saying, well, the Bible's not a book about do's and don'ts. I don't know what they're reading. It's full of do this, and it's full of don't do that. And that's in the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant. Emphasis usually on do this. Brethren, we are living in a day of abject confusion of what it means to be a Christian. God has always expected His people to walk in justice. Well, the God of heaven and earth is merciful. He, re he revealed Himself to Moses in Exodus, his, uh, verse, uh, chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. The Lord passed by Him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness, keeping mercy for thousands. Now, the Pharisees were still under the Old Covenant. This was all their language. They had the God of mercy, and yet they were not being merciful. Christ had preached in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now let me ask you today, are you merciful? Would somebody look at your Christian life and say, Well, you know that fellow, that woman right there, he, she's not perfect. We work with them or we live around them. But you know, they are clearly merciful people. The leaders of the nation of Israel were not. They missed it. But they didn't miss counting out the seeds. They missed big things while being self-righteous about little things. And brethren, the scribes and Pharisees thirdly had omitted faith, justice, mercy, faith. They were so trusting in themselves and their own righteousness that they had neglected their faith in God. Many of us here know the, the passage in Luke 18. In verse 10, Jesus gave this parable. Two men went up into the, into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican, a dirty, low-life tax collector. Here we have supposedly the model of righteousness and the model of a low life. They're both standing before God in the temple. I fast twice in the week, says the Pharisee. I fast. And notice what else he says. I give tithes of all I possess. You see, this is what their scrupulosity led them to. They weren't doing it out of love for God, which is what the law demands. They were doing it because, oh, well, they were supposed to do it. And we're sure going to do it the best we can. And boy, they, they left people behind, light years. But it did them no good because it became religious rags 
their self-righteousness, their filthy garments in which they stood before the Lord and said, I'm not like this low life over here. Be careful. Don't say, what an obnoxious person would that be? Because a lot of homeschoolers are just like that. We're into this, we do this, we don't do that. We've kept our children from this. And it's not very long before, of course, we've been taught the grace of God. So we wouldn't go before God and say, I'm so thankful <laughs> that I'm a homeschooler and I bake my own bread. Uh, I dress kind of like little house on the prairie and, and I'm just, wow. We wouldn't do that. We knew that we would know that the Lord wouldn't be pleased with that. But watch how outraged we get when somebody comes in and they don't agree with us on that stuff. Where's the command for that? Well, there isn't. These are derivations from biblical principles. Well, I may move out and have a farm. And that's what a lot of homeschoolers have done. And for a while I was hearing it. What, you're not moving out to a farm? No. <laughs> the Lord just put me in a city. Put me in a city. Brethren, the Pharisee is simply the, the significantly well-crafted image of our flesh in religious rags. They had missed faith. You see, the, the, the Pharisee standing before God didn't need faith. I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Look at me fasting. See my long drawn face. I'm right with God. Do you, do you see? Do you know that I tithe everything that I own? When you can pull up something, then you can set before God as your credentials to be in His holy presence you're right there with the Pharisees and not in his presence and it can be something good tithing was was fine they should have been tithing in fact that's what the Lord goes on to say he said these ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone they've missed justice they have missed justice. That's astonishing. They have missed mercy when God is merciful to them throughout their history. They have missed faith. If it's to be, it's up to me. They're doing okay in God's, in God's court. Look at the things I do. Look at the things I don't do. Look, look, look. <clears throat> but Jesus said, these ought you to have done. You should have tied those seeds. That's the law of my father. You should have tithed. That's what I'm saying. Do you think the new covenant's better? Which I do. I agree with the book of Hebrews. It's a better covenant. Then you should be out doing tithing. Because that's the old way. That's the very least you ought to be doing. Jesus said, it's perfectly okay to be scrupulous. You guys are scrupulous about this stuff, and that's fine. But it isn't fine that that's where you're comfortable and you're overlooking the big things. Brethren, we can miss the big things thinking that we're okay with our smaller things. You say, well, you've said that several times. Yeah, because we often don't hear it or even believe it and walk in it the first time we hear it. My friends, the heart of the Old and New Testament religion is faith. They missed it. But they didn't miss little scrupulous tithing. What's wrong here? They have inverted God's order. They have reversed God's order. 
God's priorities. Now that's what I want you to get. We, as professing people of God, can reverse God's order. And that does not honor Him. I'll give some examples in just a few minutes. It's about time for us to close. But I, I, I want us to grasp that Jesus is saying, you have focused on secondary matters, matters that are less important when compared to the weightier matters of justice, mercy, and faith. But that doesn't mean that the lesser matters are not important. It just means they're not as weighty as these. With many of us, what we hear is, okay, well, I'll just stick to the big things. And I don't have to worry about the little things. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's saying it's, it's all my Father's word. So it doesn't hurt us to be a little scrupulous. To look and see what's sinful and what's not. But the problem is taking secondary issues. And elevating them up to where the big issues are. And overlooking those big ones for the secondary ones. That's what's going on in this woe. Jesus denounces them publicly and brings God's judgment down upon their heads. Because they're doing this. And he calls them hypocrites and blind guides. Brethren, these are sobering passages to live with. As I told you before, we started the chapter. Well, then Jesus illustrated his point with a wonderfully absurd illustration. Now, <clears throat> when I use the word absurd, I, I do not mean it in a critical sense or criticizing. I do not mean in an insulting sense. The idea of, uh, of, the, uh, of the word absurd here is like not believable. And that's what Jesus does. He, he comes in with, with a holy hyperbole. He takes our minds and stretches them out to here. <clears throat> to drive home his point, Jesus stamped an unusual, even grotesque, illustration upon everyone's memory. He said, ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat, and swallow a camel. Now I'd say that's, a, that's a, a part of scripture that many of us have heard. Many of us have maybe even heard it preached. Once again, Jesus denounced the scribes and Pharisees because their teaching did, uh, revealed that they did not understand, interpret, or apply God's word properly. Therefore, they went astray and led their followers astray. We heard the testimony of a brother, a sound preacher now, while we were at this conference, who 32 years ago took his family and went into a cult, believing that it was because he was looking for something real. He was burned out on American religion, and he was wanting something real, something vital. Something that meant something and changed people. That's very often how sincere people get sucked into cults. And he brought him and his family, brought himself and his family into this group. And he said they barely got out. They got out with one dollar, almost no tank in their vehicle, and just drove as far as they could to get away. He was looking for something real. As many people are today. And this is what happens when you get hooked up with a blind guide. He can't lead you. He can, he can lead you astray. But he cannot lead you in God's path. And I'm going to tell you. There's only one path. And that path is under the cross. If you don't want that path, you're not going to walk with Jesus. Oh. 
sober. This is sober. So now Jesus steps into this picture and gives us a remarkable, a remarkable, absurd illustration. It's wonderful. A gnat was considered the smallest of creatures at that time. And the camel was considered the largest. So, the, you know, the, the Lord just didn't pick a couple of creatures out of thin air. He's saying, here's the smallest. Here's the biggest one. Both creatures were unclean by God's law. Again, not just random critters. But unclean animals. Forbidden to God's people. <clears throat> it was for this very reason, this, this scrupulosity of the Pharisees that they would strain their wine. They would put a cloth over the bowl or over a cup and they'd pour the wine through it. We all understand the idea of a filter, right? And, and that would keep the little insects that had gotten into the wine, which was a common feature, of drinking wine in those days. They didn't have, you know, nice metal glasses and sports cups and any of that stuff. You'd be drinking out of, you know, the hide of somebody's dead animal. But however they made them, in the vats that they made them in, you know, the, the bugs loved them. John brought us, the commentator said, gnats sip at wine and so may fall into it. It is even said that some truly faithful Pharisees would clench their teeth when they drank their wine. So if any bugs escaped the filtering, they couldn't get past their teeth. Okay, now th this is... Now, what's beating in that heart? I don't want an unclean animal to come into me. That's not wrong. In and of itself, it's God's law. But this is how focused they were on the minutiae. Minutia is not wrong, but it can't be top level. <clears throat> the scribes and the Pharisees strained out the gnats. That is, they were concerned about the small things of God's law. But they swallowed a camel. Well, nobody can swallow a camel not whole, not whole. This was the biggest of animals. And that's why the Lord chose it. It's absurd. It isn't possible. How could anyone think that something that large could ever go down the human gullet, no matter how big the person's mouth might be? <clears throat> so why does the Lord choose this? Because one, it wonderfully portrays what the Pharisees are doing in principle. They're concerned about the smallest thing, but they can swallow down something immense. Something that we wouldn't think was possible. That's the idea. They were concerned about the little things of God's law, but they were not concerned about the immense things of God's law. Let's ask ourselves. Do we live down in the little areas of the scripture? And by doing so, are we missing some really big things and obvious things that God has called us to? Let's make a couple of applications. Actually, more than a couple, but we'll make it as far as we can. So, how do we live with this tomorrow? What, what, what does it mean? Well, very simply, we're not honoring the Lord when we take secondary matters and make them primary issues. In fact, we can become totally imbalanced and we can mislead people when we do such a thing. God has an order. There are bigger things and smaller things. There are things that are more right and things that are more wrong. <clears throat> So, our first application, once again, is very simple. Because everything that we have is from the Lord, 
we should give generously from what our work produces. The Lord doesn't throw tithing out here. Now, there's a lot of debate among the Lord's people, especially between dispensationalists and those who have a, a more covenantal view of, of, the, of the scriptures. Uh, and they would say that there's no, no tithing today. I, I'm not persuaded of that perspective, uh, though I continue to consider it. These are things I go back to every few years and look over them again. Um, I don't want to mislead or misguide any of the Lord's people. But I am convinced about this, with everything that I've looked at and everything I've considered, <clears throat> the fact of the matter is, we're to be a giving people. Amen. And not just giving to others in need, that's included, but we are to give to God and His work. We are to give to God and His work. <clears throat> that's exactly why the tithe was going out there <clears throat> God's work is still going on and we are we don't live in an, an agrarian society we're not in an agriculture society anymore so few of us can give from our fruit from our corn our grain our wine our oil <clears throat> But we can give our financial resources. That's the result of our work. We get a paycheck. We ought to be giving, I would say, if the old covenant is the lesser covenant, and this is the greater covenant, and all of the fulfillments of the things uh, typed in the Old Testament are greater and bigger and better in the new, then we ought to be giving at the very least a tenth. At the very least tenth more if possible <clears throat> well I can't do all the things I want to do if I had to do that well what do you want to do and how more important than God's work is it those are the questions we have to ask well I just want to sit back and get my fifth wheel and enjoy my retirement enjoy your retirement don't quit working for the Lord and use what the Lord has given you for His glory. Take that fifth wheel and when you go park it somewhere, hook it up, hop out, give someone some of the gospel tracts that you've been carrying around in it. There are so many ways that we use who and what we are to God's glory. It's His. So we ought to be freely giving it to His work. Yeah, this now, this is not one of those television, you know, appeals here. We're going under. Let's just send me some money. I'll send you this anointed hanky if you'll send me a hundred bucks. That, I'm not talking about that. I'm saying giving to God's work because he's given to you. Give to God's work because he's given to you. We have six worldwide ministries here. Just to open the doors every weekday cost money. And again, I'm making no appeals. I'm simply saying, look around you and make sure that what God has given you is being used for his glory. That's his car. Even if you're paying the notes on it, that's his car. That's, he gave you the health to make the money to pay the notes. It's all his. Won't even get into stewardship. But I, I will certainly say, there are those that have held, as, as the elders here have, that that tithing is still a biblical principle. But as I consider, reconsider, and do all these things, I, I say to you what I've just said. <clears throat> if you think it's not a part of new covenant living, it ought to be better. It ought to be better. Secondly, all sins are damning, but there are greater and lesser degrees of sin. This, this passage makes it clear. And yet that's not what American Christianity generally teaches. All sin is just sin. And so if, you know, if you were a chainsaw murderer and you over here were just a pickpocket, it's no big deal. You're, you're, it's, all sin is just sin. That is heresy. And that's being taught in big churches. It certainly makes a difference what you do. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, said our Lord. 
Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon at the day of judgment than for you. It's going to be worse. Children, young people, the Lord is setting His truth before you and I plead with you to repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are more responsible than the children out there that are never hearing the Word of God. It will be worse for you in the day of judgment, having been given the blessings of God, the truth of God, the love of God set before you and modeled before you. And then you go, oh no, I want to live my own life. It will be worse for you. It will be worse for pew sitters. If you're not born of God's Spirit, better that you never hear the word of Jesus. Every blessing and mercy that God shows you in His Son comes from His astonishing and amazing grace. But those will be so many witnesses that will stand before you in the day of judgment and said, you heard the truth and you refused it. Come to Christ. Come to Christ. Brethren, it is why our sins are worse than the sins of the heathen. We're sinning against the revealed grace of God. That should make us, in a proper and biblical sense, scrupulous. What brings glory to the Lord and what doesn't? I need to make sure. I mean, do you think that those that are living out there partying when it's spring break and doing all of that are worse than you? What are you doing with the light you have? That's the way the Lord measures it. That's why it's going to be worse for Chorazin. That's why it's going to be worse for Capernaum. They're living out there in their ignorance. You've been told... Here's the word of God. Here's what God loves. Here's what God hates. Here, you cannot save yourself. God in his mercy has sent his son to save people just like you. Repent and believe him for everlasting life. That is a blessing from God to turn your back on it because I want to be cool. Well, damn you. And it'll be worse than all the people out there that think they are. We need to understand that all sins are damning. All sins are damning. Every single one of them. A bite of fruit got us into all of the horror that we see in this world. But there are greater and lesser degrees. There are more important righteousnesses to be holding on to, even though we want to hold them all. Sometimes it just feels like we're juggling and dropping the balls, right? But we need to have some idea of what is glorifying to God and what is primary and what is secondary. I don't care if your children are modest, and you've got a nice big black leather bound Bible, and you've memorized most of the New Testament if you reject the deity of Christ. That's bigger. The God-man is bigger. The Trinity. I don't care if you have what looks like in that. We've, we've had people here leave before to go to certain groups that utterly reject our understanding of grace, but they wanted to go live in the standards those people lived in. Those standards mean Nothing unless they arise from a heart of grace and love for Jesus Christ. Amen. Not to save me, not to keep me saved. No, brethren, there are greater and lesser things. The Trinity constantly attacked. The deity of Christ, 
the grace of God in the gospel and what it really means. Well, number three, being focused on lesser matters of God's word is not wrong, but elevating lesser matters to the level of weightier things is. Let me give you just an example. <clears throat> At one time in the history of our congregation, there, we had a lot of debaters and debaters going out and, and you know, homeschool debating and all that kind of stuff. That's all fine. You know, I have no problem with debating. <laughs> Children have been doing it with their parents from the time they could say more than three sentences. You know, I mean, we, we grow up around debates. We, we debate one another, so to speak. And, and I mean, all, you know, all, all of that's fine. But when we go out to the debate, and then the next day, even though we won the debate and give all the glory to God, we don't go to worship. We're too tired. Then there's a problem with debating. Understand? What's more important than winning the debate? Worshiping God. It doesn't matter whether it's a family outing. We love families. <laughs> but you can worship your family. We love families. We want them to be healthy. We want husbands and wives to be like Christ in the church. And we want parents bringing their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But when we start taking our family events and, oh, can't make it to church. I'll walk carefully here. But if you're more excited about these so-called holidays that are coming than the Lord's Supper, you're right in bed with the Pharisees. Those holidays are not as important as the worship of God and the things that he's commanded. This is a principle that we've been over before, but we all need to think about it. Here's the principle. There are things that are permitted and there are things that are commanded. We cannot jettison the things that are commanded for things that are permitted. If you get that, it will be very helpful to you. Things that are permitted are simply that. They're permitted. You can or you don't have to. But things that are commanded are not negotiable. The worship of God is not, not, not negotiable. We could go on with all kinds of things, brethren. Things that in themselves are good, but they cannot be elevated to the things that are non-negotiable. The weightier matters justice, mercy, faith, worship. Well, I hope that's clear. Every one of us can take something that's good, but we make it so important. Now, we all get bent out of shape with someone who's got their pet doctrine, and they're always hounding on that, and we get a little tired of hearing it once in a while. Okay, 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 let's talk about this, let's talk about that. Okay, he always comes back to this. And it's almost as if that thing, which is important but secondary, becomes the acid test for whether you're really a Christian. Now, it might be an evidence that you're not a Christian, but it's not a surefire thing. Some people just take what's secondary and they push it up to the top and then that's where they always are with their secondary deal. What did Jesus say? You ought to have done that. You ought to have counted your seeds out. But not at the expense of faith. I hope that's clear. So that, that, that way, all I have to do is just say the next two and we'll be done. And that's it. We must therefore give ourselves to spirit-filled study and meditation of the word so that we may learn to discern the lesser from the weightier matters of God's word. This is where we find out what the most important thing is. All of what God says is important. There's not anything in here that we can ignore. But there are some things that are greater, and we've got to study in there. That's why we need to meditate upon the Word of God. And fifthly, to keep God's priorities in proper perspective, let us give much time to what matters most. 
Now I added that last and it may not have made it to your outline. But to keep priority, God's priorities in proper perspective, let us give much time to what matters most and work out from there. We must begin with the gospel. We must begin with the gospel. We must begin with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to him, our Savior, as our Lord. So that as he speaks, we do what he wants us to do. When we walk in his word, it is amazing how we begin to see other things. But if we just sit around and say, well, you know, God chose me before the foundation of the world and that's it. And I'm going to make it to heaven. That's exactly the kind of thing that has damned people throughout the history of the church. If you've been chosen, if you're one of God's elect, <clears throat> there's a heart in you to walk with Christ. Feeble, you may be. Limited, of course we all are. But there will be a heart in you to know him, to love him, and to walk with him. So we must begin with Christ. And then we must continue with Christ. And we will end our course with Christ. All right? And then as we work out these things in our lives, we weigh them by the glories of the gospel and of Christ and what he saved us to be. The scribes and Pharisees reverse God's priorities, and so can we. It's possible for us to do so. So let us look in the mirror of God's words and see if it be so. What do I do if I discover there's Pharisee? ism in me repent and look to the glorious lord jesus christ look to him who saves even pharisees and forgives us when we fall into our fleshy phariseeism and then let us learn to walk with him in the weightier matters without ignoring the secondary amen father we're weak and feeble we need thee every day. Without thee, we will be nothing but hypocrites, Pharisees, scribes, and apostates. But by thy grace, we're thy children. Father, I do not wish in one moment to saddle one of thy children here with something that thy word does not teach. Give the pastors here Great light, correct us of any of our errors. Whatever perspective we take on things in which we disagree with one another. Lord, may we humble ourselves before thy word and make sure that we're operating out of love for thee and love for one another. Always. And if you correct us and show us that we're wrong, please grant us the grace to repent and to walk in the love that thou hast commanded us. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me. You've been very patient today. Thank you. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Christ Jesus, or through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go in the name of the Lord.